Thank you, Tim. This morning, as you can see on the screen here, the title of the message is Commands to the Unable. Now, what made me start thinking about this a few years back is you always hear individuals say that sinners are dead as this piece of wood here as far as believing the gospel. They say, you know, they're dead as this piece of wood. And then some individuals will say, well, we're not dead as that piece of wood. We can hear and we can understand what the preacher is saying concerning the gospel. Uh, so we're not dead like that piece of wood. But as I thought about that, you know, concerning spiritual things, concerning believing the gospel from the heart, we are as dead as a piece of wood concerning that. We make decisions constantly, all the time in this, in this life. Uh, you made a decision to come here today. You have a will, but that will is in bondage to that sin nature that we all have by nature. And so I was looking over the Internet a few years back, and I saw a sermon right here, Commands to the Unable, that I, Pastor uh, Gary Shepherd had delivered. And I decided to hold on to it. And uh, so the other week, other week when Bill asked me to get a message together, I, I decided to go ahead and use it and to deliver it. And so this morning, the main text, as you can see, John eleven forty three. Here we have an occasion where Jesus is standing uh, here at Lazarus' death is standing before the tomb of Lazarus. And in this 43rd verse here, where John says, And when he, when Christ thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I don't know of a better scripture to use, a better picture and type, whereby we can see the condition of being dead and this state uh, and condition that grace meets and that the gospel meets. Because Lazarus here is commanded to do what he cannot do. And the reason he can't do it of himself is because he's dead. And in the gospel, men and women are commanded to do what they cannot do. And that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're talking about the true Christ of scripture. And the reason they can't do it is because they're spiritually dead. That is the state that the Bible describes all men by nature as born of Adam. But to show further this spiritual deadness, men logically say that God would not command us to do something that we cannot do. But that statement in itself is just another evidence of that spiritual deadness. And it is the very logic that forms the basis for such foolish notions as free will of religion and provides the basis for all modern decisionalism. That is, when preachers tell men and women that Christ has done all he can do and now it's up to you to make a decision to accept him. But that is the very thing that has taken place all the way back to Exodus when Moses is up on Mount Sinai and God is giving him the law while at the same time, at the bottom of that mountain, those Israelites are diso disobeying the very law that God given. So to say that God would not command us to do or require of us that which we cannot do is just not to answer this situation. One might say, well, some of them tried to keep the law, but that is not what the law says. The law says to do and live, disobey and die. It's, it, it, and, and man's idea of free will is definitely not the biblical view of how God in grace and mercy has dealt with this situation of God's commands and man's inability. So there goes on this debate whereby set against each other on the one hand is God's sovereignty and on the other hand is man's responsibility. But we have to be careful when we talk about man's responsibility. Lest we forget 
that there's really no ability in man's responsibility as it relates to man making spiritual decisions. Just because man's responsible to God and responsible to obey and responsible to do these things, that does not mean automatically that he has the necessary ability. And that's why salvation has to be all of grace. That's why salvation has to be all of the Lord. That's why it has to be all of God's saving power. Because if you look back in John 6 here that Timothy read, our Lord made two statements that show the absolute deadness and inability of a sinner to do anything positive toward God spiritually. Here in John 6, 44, it states this matter of inability. Christ says no man can. Now there's a difference between may and can. May having to do with permission. May I do this, may I do that. And can having to do with ability. John 6, 44 says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I'll raise him up at the last day. And after he says that no man can come to me, some immediately murmured, as Timothy read. And by that murmuring and unbelief, they demonstrated just the very thing that Christ has stated in verse 44. So he goes on just a little bit later and restates in John 6, 65. Christ again says, and he says, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my Father. And you would think that these two statements, as well as some others, would, uh, were not even in the Bible that most of modern religion carries so religiously. He simply said, no man can of himself, by himself, come to me or believe on me. So why does God command men and women to do to do what they cannot do. Well, the number of reasons. I believe the first one is to show us our helplessness and our inability to do the least thing in saving ourselves. God also does it to show us his power. He does those things which bring glory to him and him alone. Now, and he does it also, as scripture says, to magnify and to glorify his free grace to show us that salvation must be all of God's free grace. And he does it to show us that he's God and he alone makes the difference between saved and lost. Men say God loves everybody. They follow that with Christ dying for everybody. Then they follow that with the Holy Spirit trying to save everybody. So the difference in salvation according to this kind of teaching and doctrine is if God has done all he can do that would leave the difference in salvation in your hands or my hand or the hands of any other rebel, rebel sinners such as we are by nature but God makes these statements as we have in John 6 as he says these things to show us our helplessness and to show us that it's God alone that makes the difference in salvation not us, not by works. Paul said to those believers in 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 4, verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And if thou received it, why dost thou glory, as if thou hast not received it? If you don't have anything except what God alone gave you, if you cannot attribute your salvation to anybody but God in Christ alone, that means that you and I can only make our boast in the Lord. We do not believe that God purposed to save every person. And while it is obvious that the gospel has not gone out to all men without exception, we do believe that scripture commands, commands us and as God directed us, that as far as we are enabled to do, we are to preach the gospel to every creature. We do that because God commands it. 
We do it because God gets the glory in the preaching of his son. And we do not believe that any sinner is born again without and separate from the gospel being preached. That's because the object of that faith that God gives us is in the new birth. The object of that faith that is revealed in the gospel is the Lord Jesus Christ. We also do not believe in gospel regeneration. That is, we do not believe that simply because the gospel is preached that men and women will buy it or believe it. Look at how many of our family members, our friends, and just people in general that we have told them about this true gospel of how God saves the sinner and seen them reject it and even get upset and mad in certain cases. We know that the gospel that's preached must be attended by divine power. You must be born again, Christ told Nicodemus. The gospel goes out as it is proclaimed in this world. And I'm talking about the true gospel now, not a false gospel. I'm talking about the gospel wherein the righteousness of God is revealed, declared, made manifest. But that gospel is truly preached as it might be. And I do pray and we all do, that it be more clearly preached. But if God does not send his spirit to regenerate and give spiritual life to that sinner, that gospel will fall on the ears and in the minds and in the hearts of all who are of themselves, still spiritually dead. God must make his elect willing in the day of his power. We are preaching to spiritually dead men. We are commanding things from God that they are unable even to hear spiritually, much less believe. We do these things at God's command. And we know, like the old hymnal writer wrote in his hymn, when he says, all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One come down. That is my prayer for these days in which we live. I know that there's not a lot of true gospel preaching today, but while I know that there's not a lot of gospel preaching as it's compared with all the false religion that's out there being taught today, I'm yet thankful for the amount of the true gospel preaching that's going on in our day. God has not left himself without a witness. And one thing that always encouraged me about our ministry here at Eager Avenue Grace Church is that God has laid that burden on our hearts for sending the gospel out into the world and has encouraged us to make great efforts to send forth and proclaim the true gospel, that gospel that gives all the glory to God and none to the sinner. But as we send it forth, as we proclaim it, and I pray that it's joined and attend it with the power of the Holy Spirit, especially in this technical age in which we live. We're able here to send the gospel forth to those that hear it through the Internet, and it may not even be possible in this lifetime for us to meet those believers or to see them that have come in contact with this gospel that's out there. And me and Randy's talked about this many times. That might, that might not be a bad thing that we are not able to see them. <clears throat> they may be located in a foreign land, but by virtue of the Internet, they're able to hear the gospel, and God graciously saves them by his grace. So my prayer is that God would attend the preaching of this gospel by his spirit. I know that the success of the preached gospel does not depend on our ability or our inability. It depends on the ability of God the Spirit to awake these dead sinners just like he woke us up and reveal Christ in our hearts. You see, God gives the enablement to his people and his elect in the hour that God has appointed are enabled to do what they would otherwise be unable to do 
and that is to believe this gospel. <clears throat> Lazarus here was dead, and he could not do on his own what was commanded by Christ to do. Our Lord spoke to this man who had been dead so long that even his sister said, well, by now he sure stinks. And how it must have seemed foolish to them for Christ to stand before Lazarus' very tomb, this man dead and rotting, and say to him, Lazarus, come forth. You see, when God speaks to his people, it's a very personal and effectual call. In other words, it accomplishes something when the Holy Spirit comes. Christ said, Lazarus, and when God speaks to a sinner through the gospel, and by that all-knowing, all-wise, and all-mighty Holy Spirit, when he speaks to us, there's no mistake about it, about who's talking to us. We cannot, in any activity of ours, we cannot, in any working or doing or whatever it is, nothing can drown out the sound of the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts through that preached gospel. There is a saying that we may run, but we can't hide. Well, that's surely the case when God calls his elect to himself in his own time. So he speaks effectually to Lazarus, and Lazarus could not do on his own what he was commanded to do. But he did because the command was attended by divine power and by the enablement and quickening power of the Holy Spirit of God. If you look back in verse 26, and this is what our Lord said to Martha. He says in John eleven twenty six, 26. And whatsoever liveth, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You look at that verse and you tell me what the order is. Religion says if you will believe, if you, uh, you'll live. But when you say that, it would be like saying to a dead person uh, left to themselves, if you believe or if you move your hand up or wave your little finger or something like that, you'll be made alive. No, it says whosoever lives, God must make you alive before you'll believe this true gospel. This spiritual life that God gives must precede or come before God-given faith because God-given faith is the evidence of that life. And you've heard our pastor give this analogy many times. When a baby is born, we don't expect that baby to cry in order to have life. We rejoice when he cries because by that cry we know it has life. And that's the way it is with faith. When a person is brought to forsake all other hopes and to cease from their own works of righteousness, which is called dead works in Scripture, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we find an individual who believes and trusts in the blood and righteousness of Christ alone and forsakes all else, we rejoice. We know that these evidences are signs of life because the Spirit of God has attended the preached gospel. When God makes alive, all believers do something that by nature none of us would do, and that is to look outside of ourselves and to look to the one who we had never seen before, and we rejoice in him and trust our whole salvation and eternity in him. This one that because of our deadness and blindness, we had Never seen before. Now, all of us that have been in false religion, we thought we'd seen him. We thought we believed in Christ, the Christ of the Bible. We thought we did. We thought we knew him. But really, we'd never seen the true Christ before. Never seen him until God awoke us out of that deadness by his Holy Spirit. Now, how could we do that? How could we one day hear in the gospel saying about the true Christ of the Bible and change our whole minds about this whole thing? 
Well, it's because the Spirit of God not only commands us, but he enables us in that command to do what we otherwise could not and would not do. You see, we by nature will not turn loose of having sole control over our destiny. Turn over to Matthew 9. We'll look here. This is another occasion of one of the miracles that Christ performed. In verse 5, he says to those standing around this paralyzed man, this man sick of the palsy, he says, For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thy house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now this man with the palsy could not do what Christ had commanded of himself, that that is. It would be like me or you uh, walking into a hospital and seeing someone laying in, in the bed there paralyzed from the neck down and say, you get up, get out of your bed, take the bed and go home to your house. Well, this man with the palsy couldn't do that of himself. But when Christ commanded him and joined that command with that power, he arose and departed to his house. You see, God alone has absolute power. And when he commands, he has the power to overcome all the obstacles in order to make it happen. This man with the palsy was commanded by Christ to do what he was unable to do of himself, but he did it. And why And why did he do it? It was because of the one who, who gave him that command. Now, Let's look at Luke's gospel in chapter 7. This is another miracle. This is an occasion when a funeral procession was passing our Lord. In verse 12, it says, Now when he came nigh, speaking of Christ, to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, which is the frame on which that coffin sits. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. Now a lot of people see these, these miracles that Christ performed, but they only see them with the eyes of the flesh. And they're impressed by all the miracles. And in scriptures, it talked one time about a lot of them followed Christ because of the miracle. But they're impressed with the things that Christ did while he was on this earth. They say, well, he raised people from the dead. And he did. But I tell you something, that miracle is nothing to compare with the power and the glory of the event when God raises a dead sinner, the spiritual life. Now that's a miracle of grace because by nature, we won't believe this gospel. Y'all know that. Y'all been confronted men throughout all this time we, we've come to the gospel. But it is spiritually dead. And then it says in Luke 7, 7 15, speaking of this dead man. It says, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Once again, that can't be, can it? He was commanded to do what he, like Lazarus, was unable to do, but he did it. And his inability did not alter or diminish Christ's ability. We need to always understand that as we preach the gospel, we call upon people to do what they cannot do of themselves. By nature, they cannot and will not come to the true God of the Bible because we're all born with that natural enmity in our hearts toward everything about God and his truth. 
Webster defines this enmity as hatred or ill will. Christ talked to his disciples and he told them about it. He said, they'll hate you. They'll throw you out of the synagogue. As those Pharisees were told by Christ, who was live himself in John 5, 40, you will not come to me that you might have life. That verse alone shows the foolishness of sinners' so-called free will. Christ himself said, you will not come to me that you might have life. This reminds me, and some of you have heard this before, reminds me of what someone said a number of years ago, a believer. He says when he was talking to a person that believed that a sinner is born with a free will as it relates to spiritual things. He said that that person promoting free willism said that the gospel <clears throat> is like a big chocolate cake. All you have to do of your own free will is just reach out and take a piece of that chocolate cake. That's how that free will person described that. Well, the believer answered back and told the man that there was just one thing wrong with that analogy. And that is that sinners by nature, born under this earth, don't like chocolate cake. In fact, they hate chocolate cake. And that's what scripture says. You see, all men by nature just don't want salvation God's way. By nature, we're all spiritually dead. This is a fact all men born of Adam are of, a, are of themselves spiritually dead. We all died in Adam, and only believers are made alive in Christ. As a matter of fact, all the miracles that Christ performed in the gospel accounts were given as examples to show the spiritual condition of the sinner. Spiritually dead, spiritually deaf, spiritually blind, spiritually paralyzed, and spiritually putrefied. Spiritually, now, but we preach as commanded, and we preach what's commanded, knowing that we have no power of ourselves, knowing that the most talented preacher, the most learned preacher, the most gifted preacher, as far as the ability to define and to explain the gospel, it'll all be in vain if the power is ours alone. The one that gives ability is God alone, salvation of the Lord. God will attend his gospel with the power, with power to every one of his elect, his sheep, because he says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. If they're in this awful condition, if they are by nature unwilling, if they are unable of themselves to do anything, anything, any of these things that we're talking about, even what men say is the most simple thing, which is to believe on Christ, the true Christ. Know this, that God says in his word in Psalm 110, verse 3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. God is able to make his people willing in his own time and by his spirit. The apostles, just like today, they preached Christ and him crucified to the spiritually dead. And God brought them to spiritual life. God tells us in John 6, where Christ says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him. Now you ought uh, to go home and do a little word study on that word draw, which it talks about in this, this verse here. Because in, a re in religion, you're made to think that that means something like God invites you or exerts a little influence on you or woos you to come to the gospel. The word draw is the same word that's used when Peter drew out his sword and cut off the high priest's servant's ear. It's the same word that's used when they drew the nets that were overfilled with all those fishes. Now, Peter's sword did not just leap out of his own free will. Peter, he had to draw it. Now, it says here 
except the Father which has sent me draw it. But even before Christ said that, said that, he stood there in the face of those Pharisees who totally rejected him. And he says in John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And I, he says, Come to me, and him that comes to me I will no wise cast out. Let me show you one more passage, and then we'll close. And I'm sure you all familiar with this. This is Ezekiel 37. Here's another scripture. Long before Christ came, the same situation with the prophet Ezekiel. Scripture says in Ezekiel 37, 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the midst of the valley which was full of dry bones. Every gospel preacher that has ever stood to preach the true gospel has stood just like Ezekiel. All God's called preachers stand in front of a valley of spiritually dry bones. And then it says in verse 2, it says, And caused me to pass by him round about, and behold, there were many, very many, in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. They'd been dead a long time. Then in Ezekiel 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. It seems as though Ezekiel was saying, Lord, if it depends on me, they can't. But you know. Then in verse 4, And again he said to me, Prophesy upon these bones. Preach. Preach to them. Declare any, he said, declare my message upon these bones. And I said unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. They can't hear. They've been dead a long time. You're preaching to a graveyard, Ezekiel. Then God says in verse 5, Thus said the Lord God, of these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you. And you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And what's going to be the evidence that he made them alive? Well, at the end of verse 6 here it says, And you shall know that I am the Lord. I'm the Lord. That's the evidence that they've been made alive. And so I prophesied, and I was, as I was commanded, and I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them about, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, preach, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. In Scripture, you know that the wind is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Now, the last verse here, verse 10, says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. These dry bones did what they couldn't do of themselves. They did what Ezekiel could not do for them. He issued the command God gave him, just like preachers of the gospel. Declared the message God put in his heart and mine, the word of the Lord. He preached it to a bunch of dead folks, and the Spirit of God made them alive. And they acknowledged Christ as the Lord because it says in the end of verse 6, And you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, these things ought to encourage us. Those of us who stand up here and deliver these messages, those of us as believers who also witness to friends and co-workers and such, and who bear witness of the gospel, all of us. 